So I think we will take a few minutes for questions. I have one. It seems to me that, uh, at least in the broadest sense, uh, our government uh, programs ref reflect the public viewpoint on issues. It may be a timing issue. It may take a while for, for government to respond, but it does seem to me that, that ultimately governments respond to public pressure. And I'm wondering how, how, how you folks read the public on this issue at this point. Do you see its interest as going up? Do you think it's plateaued? Do you think there's a concern that there'll be fatigue around this issue? Because I think we probably all agree there's not gonna be a quick fix on, on this one. How, how do you read the public? Well, I can start. Uh, I would like to think that as uh, future leaders come into office that uh, the more we talk about the prevention and public health themes of health reform and the Affordable Care Act, the more we see results from community transformation grants and other population-based approaches seen here, the, the more we have evaluation and outcomes with ROI results and other hard evaluations, the more we can convince policymakers and um, leaders also in the private sector that, that prevention and public health is where the long-term investment should be. So this, this is a beginning. We're still very much at the beginning uh, of, a, of a long journey. But what heartens me is that, at least an administration ago, we didn't have any of this conversation going on. And um, one example that I, that I cite, and Jeff is very, very involved in this, is the prevention fund itself. Uh, didn't exist until the Affordable Care Act was passed, and now uh, that, that is a, a dedicated source that, that can promote prevention and public health nationally. Commissioner Bartlett mentioned that there is an analogous fund for the state of Massachusetts, and many other states can hopefully uh, replicate that model too. So I, I'm hoping that we can continue to have the public um, and leaders share their experiences here and, and promote that prevention and public health theme. I'll just add two very quick things. One is I think the public, certainly in polling that we've seen, gets this notion of the balance between what happens in the clinic and what happens in the community. Uh, I think what we haven't done as good a job of explaining is, because we in this room, we've all been guilty of it, um, have really focused on the social determinants, on the built environment, on policy and systems change. And most people, however, start, and most elected officials start with personal responsibility and that we all have a response, and we do all have a responsibility to make as healthy a choice as we can. And we have to walk people from that notion of personal responsibility to people can't exercise that personal responsibility unless they're in an environment and have the resources to actually do the things that we are advising them to do. And I think we sometimes miss that first part, and by missing that first part, we're sometimes losing elected officials. I, I think along that line, uh, one of the principles that I'm very mindful of is sort of building on the science-based side of it, the evidence-based side. And we in our nutrition education program, for example, these days are very much focused. We have a toolkit that's evidence-based uh, that we have been sharing across the country uh, as it relates to obesity uh, uh, prevention and education. And I'm mindful of the, the, uh, the school-based new meals that we've deployed, evidence-based. The polling shows the majority of parents in the country support this. But if you only read certain or only watch certain networks that I don't choose to watch, uh, you would believe that, gee, there's a major revolt about uh, kids uh, eating healthier foods at school. And uh, I think that's one of the challenges that we have these days that we, we don't live in a world anymore of uh, three major networks and uh, newspapers uh, from one end of the country to the other. We have the cable networks that really exploit the extremes. And uh, to, so to your question about do, do you think the public is going to be with us, I think as long as we stay on an evidence base for those areas for which we have evidence and uh, stay the course in that regard, I think we will prevail. I, again, I'm speaking parochially here in terms of uh, what we've done in school meals or what we've done in the WIT program. There were, you know, some parts of industry were saying a few to us on WIC several years ago, if you have these new uh, food requirements in WIC stores, you're gonna lose thousands of stores across the country. I don't think we lost half a dozen stores out of 60,000. So staying the course is one aspect of this. Ricky? 
Thank you. Um, and thanks for this panel. This is great. My question is about what's needed to get to the health and all policies vision. And I'm wondering if it's people or policy that is preventing the crosstalk being at the level that we'd like. In other words, are there reasons why, because of the mandate within an agency, you know, a branch of government, that they can't do some of the things that you might talk about would be nice to do across the different agencies? If I can answer first, I, the more I look at this and the more I hear questions like yours, Shariki, I, I'm convinced the answer is leadership. Getting people at the highest level to commit and then sending the message throughout their organization. That's what these mayors are doing for Let's Move Cities, Towns, Counties. That's what the president did by having this action plan created in 2010. That's what the first lady is doing, uh, using her bully pulpit in an extraordinary way. So I think honoring, recognizing, fostering, encouraging that leadership any way, shape, and form is what we do. The President's Council for Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition, we have some phenomenal figures uh, in the fitness, uh, sports, and nutrition world who, who are recognized leaders who uh, have given their time to send the message to. So I am convinced the more I do this that that's really the solution to a lot of it. Because if one key leader steps forward in every community who has got a lot of clout and says, okay, we're going to do this and I'm going to bring everybody to the table and we're going to do this together, that, that can just obviate a lot of unnecessary meetings and negotiations at a much lower level. So. I would, I would personally love to hear more about that theme. From but I, would, I, I guess the one thing that I would add to that, I, I, leadership is the prerequisite, but I think part of your question was getting at how do we get this within the government to become more imbued into the culture, and I think that comes from direct experience. Leaders do come and go. We heard earlier, mayors come and go. And so until we start create, and so the current leadership that is committed to this needs to create those moments where agencies are working across their silos, programs are working across their silos, so the experience is had that changes ultimately the behavior. This is about behavior change. You know, we're talking, all this obesity discussion we're having is about obesity change. This is a different kind of behavior change, and people are stuck in their silos, stuck in their cultures, and it's all about culture change, and that takes time, and it takes some forced changes, some forced collaborations, I think, to ultimately overcome that. But it's not illegal, that's what you're saying. It's not illegal, okay, no. <laughs> well, in concluding this uh, panel, let me thank everyone very much for taking the time to join us, and thank you all very much for what you're doing to support this issue. <laughs>